Elijah McClain. The law, the facts. My name is Nate the Lawyer, and welcome to the Brody's Bunch, where you are the jury of today's content. Now, before we get started, don't forget to like this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel if you liked what you hear. Now, for those of you out there who have never seen any of my police breakdown videos, here are the rules. One, you are the jury. You're going to be making the decision whether these incidents are justified or not. Now, I will provide the facts, I'll provide the law, but you will provide the opinion. Now, this is not legal advice. It's just not. Today's case, we're going to talk about Elijah McClain, a 23-year-old black male. He was a massage therapist and he was killed by police in August of 2019. Now, with all of these videos, first we start with the law. Now, I need to explain to you the law behind seizures of persons here in the United States. That includes arrest and things like stop and frisk. So in the United States, if the police want to either detain you for a short period of time or seize you, which is an arrest, they have to do so based on the Constitution. Now, specifically, we have to talk about the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures of citizens. So first, let's talk about brief detainments that are known as stops. Now, you may have heard them by other terms. For instance, stop and frisk. They're known as Terry stops. They're also known as investigative detentions. Now, these are short detainments based on reasonable suspicion of a crime. Now, this principle comes to us from the landmark case Terry v. Ohio. In that case, the Supreme Court laid down the rules and where government agents can detain you and the rules in which they have to adhere to so they don't violate your constitutional rights. Now, examples of these detainments are stop and frisk and a traffic stop. Now, in the case of Terry v. Ohio, the Supreme Court said these type of detainments or stops have to occur based on reasonable suspicion. So our first question has to be, well, when does a stop occur? Well, the Supreme Court answers that question and says, a stop occurs when a reasonable person would not believe that they are free to leave. There's a case out of Florida, Florida v. Royer. The defendant flew into an airport and police stopped him. So what were the facts? Well, the defendant was taken to a small room. Police took the defendant's license and luggage and told him to sit in that room. The Supreme Court said a reasonable person in that defendant's position would not believe that they're free to leave. They took his ID, they took his luggage. Where is he going? And the courts also make it clear that if any physical force is used to detain you, you are not free to leave. Also, if police use their authority to detain you, stop, police, don't move, you are also legally detained. Essentially, you're not free to leave. Think about it also in the context of a traffic stop. If the police pull you over, can you just run? No, you're not free to leave. You've been detained. If you are not free to leave and have been detained by government agents like the police, that detainment must be based on reasonable suspicion. So what is reasonable suspicion? Reasonable suspicion is defined as whether a reasonable person would have believed that the person being stopped was involved in criminal activity. And the court explains how officers can determine reasonable suspicion. In Terry, the court says, Reasonable suspicion is gained by specific and articulable facts that are more than a hunch or a feeling. Here's an example. Let's say police get a radio call that there's a white male in a red hood with blue jeans and that person's acting suspicious. Then police find this guy in that specific area. Well, they've checked off all those boxes. White male, red hood, blue jeans, acting suspicious. In the area, witnesses said that that person will be in. Do we have reasonable suspicion? Well, I think it would be clear to say, yes, we do. We have very specific and articulable facts. That's more than a hunch. Now, we also have to understand that something like race alone or gender, for instance, is generally not enough to conduct a Terry stop. If you're only conducting Terry stops based on someone's gender or based on someone's race, that's known as racial profiling. Now, this is what was happening in New York City. And this practice was found to be unconstitutional. Now, just for some background, in New York City, if police were called to a minority neighborhood for a report of a suspicious minority male, police would conduct Terry stops of all minority men in that area. As a result, 
90% of the people who were stopped and frisked by police were innocent. They had committed no crime. And 90% of the people being stopped in the city happened to be minorities. Now this approach was found to be unconstitutional because stops based on race alone without consideration to any other factors was unconstitutional. Here's Mike Bloomberg explaining the policy. And the way she got the guns out of the kids' hands is uh, to throw them against the wall and, and frisk them. Because then they start, they say, oh, I don't want that, I don't want to get caught, so they don't bring the gun. They still have a gun, but they leave it at home. Now, just to be clear, we had government agents stopping millions of American citizens who had committed no crimes, searching them for weapons just because they were black. The NYPD's reasonable suspicion was simply being a minority male in a minority neighborhood. That's not reasonable suspicion. That's profiling. Now think about it. Based on that logic, you can stop all white men in an all white neighborhood based on this type of reasonable suspicion. It's obviously too generalized. And this is what got the NYPD in trouble. That's why the practice had to end. You know, I always think, what if this was happening in a state like Texas, where police would get a call to a white neighborhood and then would stop every white man in a white neighborhood and search them for weapons? I don't think that would happen. Now, one thing very important to this case is that if police have reasonable suspicion to stop, they can do a couple of things. They can detain the suspect, right? They can also demand ID. Let me see your ID. They can also ask reasonable questions. Now, in some states, you have no choice but to comply with these requirements if reasonable suspicion has been established by the officer. For instance, in Colorado, it's known as a stop and ID state. What does that mean? That means state law requires individuals to answer reasonable questions and identify themselves if officers have reasonable suspicion of criminality. And generally, if you don't comply with these requests, police can arrest you if state law permits. Now, remember, these stops are short detainments. The Supreme Court says a stop can be no longer than reasonably necessary to confirm or dispel reasonable suspicion. Next, we talk about arrests. Now, if you're in the United States, all arrests have to be based on probable cause. The Fourth Amendment demands that. Now, probable cause is a higher standard than reasonable suspicion. Remember, reasonable suspicion is whether a reasonable person would believe the person being stopped is involved in some criminal activity. Probable cause is a little different. Probable cause demands that there must be a fair probability that the person being arrested has committed a crime. To illustrate the difference, running from the police may be enough for reasonable suspicion, but it's not enough for probable cause to arrest. Now here are some common ways officers gain probable cause for an arrest. The first is officer presence. If the officer just sees the crime being committed, then the officer has probable cause to make an arrest. If the officer has a credible witness and some supporting evidence. For instance, here in New York, you'll hear a lot of people say, I've been assaulted. And the first thing a police officer will ask, well, were you injured? Because for an assault to happen, you must have some physical injury. So a lot of times people will say, the guy slapped me in the face. And you'll say, well, are you hurt or were you injured? And the person says no. Then, unfortunately, you don't have probable cause to arrest that person because a crime hasn't been committed. And you don't really have any evidence to show that anything actually happened. There's no bruise. There's no injury. Officers can make inferences, but you have to be very careful with that because if you're wrong, you could go to jail. And sometimes the amount of evidence can also lead an officer to probable cause. For instance, if you have 10 witnesses who say something happened, then that's okay. You're going to likely get probable cause versus one witness or sometimes the evidence alone. That's CSI Miami or, you know, law and order, but DNA evidence, right? This is this person's DNA at a crime scene where someone was murdered. Probable cause? Yes. But probable cause is very flexible and it's going to be a specific analysis for each individual situation. Now, again, this is generally how officers obtain probable cause for an arrest. Just so we can be clear about the law, anytime you interact with police, it's called a police encounter. You're free to leave, you're free to stay, it doesn't matter. If the police want to turn that encounter into a stop where you are not free to leave, they must do that based on 
reasonable suspicion. Then if police want to arrest you, that arrest must be based on probable cause. The last thing we need to look at about the law is police use of force. Now, if you watch any of my other videos, we talk about it all the time. So we're going to mention it again, the landmark case, Graham v. Connor. Now in that case, it set out the standard of which all police use of force incidents will be judged. It's called the objectively reasonable standard. The question is, would a reasonable officer with this officer's knowledge at the time force was used, use this amount of force? We have to ask this question every time force is used by the officer. Was that force reasonable? Now, there are different ways that you can determine if that officer is being reasonable. First, what was that officer trained to do? If the officer is trained to do certain things, then it's likely that a reasonable officer will also do that, right? That's the training. The court also listed some factors. For instance, what's the severity of the crime? If we're talking about a robbery in progress versus a suspicious person, then a reasonable officer would adjust their use of force based on the circumstances. Was the suspect a serious or immediate threat? Was the suspect resisting arrest? How many officers were at the scene? Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is going to whether an officer's use of force is reasonable based on that particular situation. So now with everything that we've learned, let's now put it into action. Let's see the story of Elijah McClain and see if the officers violated this young man's rights. And again, this is not legal advice. It's August 24, 2019 in Aurora, Colorado. At 10.30 p.m., a man calls 911. Let me see, he has a mask on. He looks good, he might be okay. a good person or a bad person. Yeah. So, uh, mask on. Okay. Were any weapons involved or mentioned? No. Okay, what color is the mask or what does it look like? Black. Black mask? He's like a... Is it like a ski mask or what type of mask is it? Yeah, like a ski mask. Now, there are a couple of things that we have to understand. We have a black male at night in a residential neighborhood with a ski mask on. Now, this is pre-COVID, so this is August 2019, so this isn't where people are wearing masks. Like nowadays, this wouldn't be such a unusual thing because everyone's wearing a mask but at this point in time we have someone wearing a ski mask in a summer month in a residential neighborhood and now we have this 911 caller saying that this person is acting suspicious so at this point in time do you believe officers have reasonable suspicion and the description is pretty clear black man ski mask in this area wearing these clothes as members of the jury, you now have to determine whether officers have reasonable suspicion to stop this citizen based on these particular facts. That's your call. Elijah McLean is walking home from a nearby Shell gas station. He's holding a plastic bag with his purchases. At 10.43 p.m., Aurora police officer Nathan Woodyard spots McLean. Do a favor, stop right there. Hey, stop right there. Stop. 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 I have a right to stop you because you're being suspicious. Nine seconds after exiting his vehicle, the officer initiates physical contact. So now, this officer has used physical force to stop Mr. McLean. So now we have to ask our first question. Is this a stop under the principles of Terry v. Ohio? Now, because physical force has been used, is Mr. McLean free to leave? I would say no, because the officer used physical force to stop his progress. So that's an easy question. Here, we do have an official stop by police. But now, if that's true, then we have to ask our second question. Was this stop based on reasonable suspicion? Again, that's a jury question. That's something you have to decide. 
10.44 p.m. Officer Jason Rosenblatt and Officer Randy Wodema are now also on the scene and surround McLean. No, I am an introvert. Please respect the boundaries that I am speaking. Stop tensing up. Stop. Relax. I'm going home. Relax or I'm going to have to change this situation. Stop. Leave me alone. Sir, can you please... No, we operate, can you sorry. leave me alone? No, we're gonna First we're off, gonna talk you, to you guys started to arrest me, and I was stopping my music to listen. Now let go. The situation escalates when the officers try to move McLean onto the grass. Now here we have to ask another question. Now, Colorado is a stop and ID state. So, if you, the jury, have determined that this stop is based on reasonable suspicion, that this person may be involved in criminal activity, then state law kicks in. Has Mr. McLean provided the requisite identification and answered the requisite questions, the reasonable questions, or is he not? Because don't forget, state law in Colorado demands if police have reasonable suspicion, you have to comply with reasonable demands. Let me see your ID. Where are you going? What's your name? If you have a legally permissible stop, your next question as a jury is whether Mr. McLean is cooperating appropriately with police. And the second question is that police are using force here and there are two officers. So now you have to also ask the question whether the police use of force at this particular moment in this video is justified. Is it reasonable? Officer Woodyard's body cam is knocked to the ground. Yes. Officer Rodema says this. <laughs> it's unclear from the body cameras whether or not McLean reached for an officer's weapon. All three officers wrestle McLean to the ground. Give us more. Give us some more units. We're fighting them. At this moment, one of the officers uses a carotid control hold on McLean, a tactic that involves an officer placing his arm around a subject's neck, applying pressure, and restricting blood to the brain via the carotid arteries. In states like New York, especially for the New York City Police Department, chokeholds in any form are not available to police officers. But in Colorado, this is a technique that they use. So we have to ask our question again. Is the officer's use of force at this time reasonable. You have three officers, you have one suspect, you have a stop that seems to have deteriorated, and you have three officers here. So are all of these officers using an appropriate amount of force for this situation? You're the jury. You're gonna to have to determine whether these officers' use of force at this moment is appropriate. Would a reasonable officer have done this? This is a tough question. Responding officers later told an Aurora police investigator that McLean briefly went unconscious and the officers released the hold. At 10.46 p.m., just over two minutes after the first officer made contact with him, McLean is pinned to the ground and says this. We have, uh, we to use carotid. I'm an introvert and I'm different. Did you come out? He's out. Uh, he, was he out? Uh, he, I heard some no. snoring. I just he didn't, but he right. wasn't completely. He, no, did, he didn't lose oh, consciousness. Yeah. I'm just different. He tried I'm to just different. My he <laughs> That's all. That's all I was doing. It was actually Rosenblatt. I'm so he, sorry. For your gun, dude. I have no that's gun. Where I, that's where I tried karate. Like, I don't do out. that stuff. I don't do any Two fighting. Two other units that are not here. Why? They can slow it down a little bit. I don't move the huggins. I don't even kill flies. I don't eat meat. I do we have I'm anything other than you being suspicious? No. People. No. I mean, I tried to we stop and start walking away. At 10.49 p.m., McLean throws up a first time. Is it? We go. We go. Stop. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, was he trying to do that? I was just saying, I can't breathe correctly because... Over the next four minutes, McLean gets sick a few more times. Officers are also heard multiple times asking him to stop fighting. Rolling this way, dude. Yeah. Are you able to? Yeah. My legs locking up. There you go. Just like that. Keep. You're good. Don't, don't get right up, there. dude. It's not going to be good for you. I'm telling you right now. If you keep messing around, I'm gonna burn my dog out. He's gonna dog bite you. You understand me? At 10:54 p.m., McLean is still on the ground, and an officer says this. 
So when the ambulance gets here, we're going to go ahead and give him some ketamine. Yeah, sounds good. Perfect. Let's give that a couple minutes and then we'll put him on. Whatever he's on, he has incredible strength. Yeah, crazy strength. 10.59 p.m. A fire medic administers 500 milligrams of ketamine to McLean in an attempt to sedate him. Two to three minutes later, he is loaded onto an ambulance. And at 11.07 p.m., just over 20 minutes after the first officer made contact, responding officers are told McLean does not have a pulse. He just cored. Are you serious? Yeah. Okay. So, sit tight. McLean was resuscitated at the scene and taken to the hospital where he would be declared brain dead three days later. The coroner concluded last November that a combination of physical exertion and a yeah, narrow left coronary it, artery contributed to McLean's death, so but could not determine the cause of his death. Witness, so he added that it could have been either an accidental death caused by a reaction to the ketamine, a natural death, or a death linked to the carotid control hold used by officers. Now we're at the end of the video, and there are a couple of things that I think I need you to understand. There are incidents that are awful but unfortunately some are lawful is this one of those incidents that's your decision but the questions the legal questions are still there did the officers have a legitimate legitimate reason to stop this person was the stop based on reasonable suspicion that's your first question the second question was mr mcclain cooperating with law enforcement as required under Colorado law, the stop and ID law. And the last question you're gonna to have to answer is if whether the officers were justified to use this amount of force throughout this event. Was the force, when they first grabbed Mr. McLean, was that force reasonable? Was it reasonable to take him to the floor? Was it reasonable to put him in handcuffs? Was it reasonable? Was it reasonable to put the choke hold on him? Were these things reasonable? Now, obviously, there's been some reforms after this. Now, for instance, ketamine's not given and things of that nature. But your decision for this case, which I don't believe is an easy decision, is whether the officers were being reasonable throughout this encounter, especially with the type of force that were used. And remember, you had three officers, one suspect. They're saying he's incredibly strong. They said he reached for the gun. You have to look at all of this together and determine whether these officers were being reasonable with the force that they were used. And also, I think it's important to understand, too, as a juror, whether it's likely that Mr. McClain would have reached for an officer's gun. For instance, if he was a career criminal who fought with the police all the time and had a history of this, that would be an easier pill to swallow. But if this is somebody who's an introvert, who never had any altercation with police, then it's a little less likely that he would be reaching for an officer's gun. And the last thing that any juror needs to understand here is that absolutely no crime was committed. There was no crime. This was a call for a suspicious person. Now, how that influences your decision, one way or another, I don't know. Now, for all of you who want to dive deeper into this case, look in the description because there I have the full 600 page police report and investigative notes in the description linked. I'm telling you, it is a monster read. And that's why it took me so long to get this video out because I wanted to be clear on what I was seeing. You'll see the 911 calls, you'll see the, inv it's crazy, 600 page report, it's in the description. Check it out for yourself if you want to go deeper. And all the links to the cases and laws that I've pointed to are also linked in the description, so you don't have to go around looking stuff up. Just click the links and go to where it takes you. The district attorney for this county didn't press any charges. Was that the right decision? That's for you to decide. Also, the governor appointed a special prosecutor to look into the case again to see if the first prosecutor's decision of not to charge the officers was correct. Also note, these officers have been fired. Some of the policies of this particular town have changed. But, but, at the end of the day, it's going to be people like you who are going to be making the decisions whether this conduct is lawful or not, or if there should be changes made. 
And as always, my name is Nate, lawyer and YouTuber, and thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Peace.